Tonight you join us in Whitehaven for a special edition of Panorama. 12 dead, 11 seriously injured at the hands of an unlikely killer. He didn't look angry, not hatred, not be scared of me, not nothing, just, just a normal looking guy. The rugby club chef who found himself suddenly leading the police pursuit. At the time, I'm, I'm still talking to the police on the phone. What, what are they saying to you? And they're just, she's just saying, just calm down, just take it slow, let us know everything that's going on. And the GP who treated the injured and dying where they lay, as paramedics and air ambulances were held back until the danger was passed. It could have been crucial. Talk about the first few minutes of any, of, after any kind of accident being very important. If the scene is still dangerous, what you've got to do is secure the scene first and be sure it's safe, and then bring people in. It is just five days since Derek Bird turned this quiet part of rural England into a terrible crime scene. In a matter of hours, he went from being a trusted cabbie and popular local figure to a notorious murderer. But was an earlier opportunity to stop him here in Whitehaven missed? Richard Bilton reports now from a community still in shock, where many feel compassion not only for the victims and their families, but also for Bird himself. A midsummer dawn in the Cumbrian hills. These valleys are dotted with small villages and towns. They woke last Wednesday to a day where everything would change. A man would move along these roads and through these hills. He'd pass through seven communities. He would kill and injure people he knew and people he'd never met. It started in the small village of Rora in the Western Lakes. The 52-year-old divorcee began his day early. At 5.30, he was spotted in his car by an old school friend. He passed me just further, further on behind me, and I got in the fields with the dogs, and then as I come out of the fields, and as he went by me very slowly, his window was down, just glared and carried on. This is Derek Bird's home. It's just a modest mid-terrace. It's where a middle-aged divorcee lived on his own. Now, at some point in the early hours of Wednesday morning, Derek Bird armed himself with a shotgun, with a 2-2 rifle, and with an awful lot of ammunition. And he left his house for the last time. He got into his taxi with those two licensed guns, a shotgun and a rifle fitted with a telescopic sight and a silencer. He began this dreadful journey. I've retraced his route to try to piece together what happened on that day. It all began with a drive of just three miles to the village of Lampler. It was where his twin brother David lived. It was the early hours, we don't know the exact time, but when he got there, he shot his brother dead. The shooting at this farmhouse was the start, but what on earth pushed Bird over the edge? Well, Derek Bird seemed to have lots to live for. Last month, he became a granddad for the first time. He had two sons, and all his close family lived locally. He was a cabbie. Everybody knew the man they called Birdie, and he was well liked. I've been in his cab several times. He was always pleasant when you got into the taxi. He uh, remembered where you lived, you know, after he picked you up once or twice. It's as if we're talking about somebody completely different because it can't possibly be the same person that we knew. He was not a loner. He was a sociable man. He went on holiday with his mates and he was an active member of a local scuba diving club. But his life was more complicated. His friends say he talked about owing money. Just said that the tax man was investigating over £60,000 in the bank. But well, it seemed to be under the impression he was going to go out to prison. And I just told him he wouldn't. They either take the money off him or they'll just fine him. There's also been suggestions that Bird had fallen out with his family, an argument over a will. 
there has been an awful lot of discussion about just what was going through Derek Bird's head as he approached his brother's house. We know he had money problems because he told his friends and we know he was being investigated by the Inland Revenue because the police have confirmed that. But his family have said there was no feud. They say they have no idea why Derek Bird did what he did. What do you think the trigger was? Don't know, and I, uh, and I don't know if we'll ever know. Um, there are clearly a range of things being talked about. There are a range of inquiries that we're doing, uh, ranging from the reports of, uh, uh, about uh, his taxation affairs to disputes with other taxi drivers. All of those things uh, are being looked at. Um, but at the moment, I wouldn't want to speculate on why. Now, Bird moved on to a village five miles west. So this is Frizzington, and it's the home of Kevin Commons, who was very close friends with David Bird, that's Derek's twin brother, and he was also the Bird family solicitor. And he was about to be Derek Bird's next victim. At 10.20, the police received their first 999 call, reports of gunshots in Frizzington. Armed officers were sent to the village. Kevin Commons was found dead on the driveway of his house. Bird fled the scene straight away and drove six miles from Frizzington to Whitehaven. It was half term, the town centre was busy and Derek Bird was arriving in Whitehaven. He'd killed two people at their homes, now he was on the streets. At 10.33, police received reports of shots being fired in Duke Street. We heard a huge bang. Uh, so we obviously popped our head round the door, so what was that, thinking it was just a, a car backfire or something like that. Cumbria police are dealing with an incident in Whitehaven at the moment. Officers have cordoned off the Duke Street area. No further details are available. Derek Bird had killed again. His third victim was Darren Rucastle, a taxi driver who Bird knew. Darren Williamson, who's a former Marine, was working just yards from the shooting. As he was running around, he looked like he knew what he was doing with the gun. He was like sort of, you know, he wasn't just like haphazardly just shooting people. He, looked, he knew what he was doing. He was, he'd obviously had a lot of experience with the gun, but he knew what he was doing with that gun. Carol Youngs was the first person to try to help Darren Rucastle. As soon as I got to the door, I saw a man lying on the street. I had no idea a gun had been used. I just went to him because he looked, you know, he was lying in the street and nobody else, nobody was, was going to him. As soon as I got there, it was, it was clear he'd been shot. He had a huge wound to his face, awful. I rang, I dialed 999 on my mobile phone um, said there was a man who appeared to have been shot in the face. When Carol called the police at 10.33, there was no sign of Bird, but he hadn't gone far. Somebody screamed, he's back, and then I can remember shouting into the phone, he's back, the guy with the gun, he's back. This happened so quickly, the next second, the man was standing, pointing the gun towards where I was on the street beside Darren and then fired a shot. But Carol wasn't the target. Another cabbie, Don Reed, was shot and injured. Did you lock eyes with him then? Yes, he, he, looked, he looked at me and I looked at him, but... I don't know. That was it. He didn't, you know, he didn't shoot me. What was in his eyes when you looked at them? Nothing. Perfectly. Just like looking at you now. Not hatred, not be scared of me, not... Nothing. Just, just a normal looking guy. Derek Bird and Darren Rucastle had been friends, but in recent weeks they'd fallen out. One of the big issues for taxi drivers here in Whitehaven is pushing in in that queue, effectively not waiting in turn for a fare. Lots of the drivers are, are angry about it. Derek Bird was very angry about it. 
and according to the other cabbies, Bird believed Darren Rucastle was one of those who'd not been playing fair. Whatever the reasons for the killing, Bird now drove away. What followed was an extraordinary piece of bravery. Paul Goodwin had seen the shootings and he decided to follow Bird. This is the first time he's told his story. And I said to the police, uh, to the operator on the phone, I said, he's turning to Queen Street. Um, I'm right behind him. So you followed him? Yeah. We got to about, I got to about, uh, just as he's going around the corner, there's police coming down from the police station. And I, I see Mick Taylor running down here, just where this, this guy is here. Uh, Mick Taylor's the local town bobby, so right. everybody knows Mick. So I pulled over and I shout, Mick, get in my car, it's him in the taxi. So he jumps in? So Mick jumps in and we set off going to be on the left-hand side here. Okay. So in the chaos that followed the shootings, Paul Goodwin and a police officer were now pursuing the gunman. And there's, there's more police coming out of the police station. At this point, he's at the traffic lights. Um, we're probably about 10, 15 yards behind. There's a guy who walks around the corner here. Um, and just as the taxi pulls up... Which way does he go here? He turns left. Yeah. There's a guy who pulls up, the guy walks around the corner here, yeah. and I just seen him jolt back and put his hand to his face and he's got blood on his hands, and I looked at him, and I said to Mick, I said, it's Paul, it's my taxi driver, that's three taxi drivers. Paul Wilson had become the third taxi driver to be shot by Bird in a matter of minutes, and again, he aimed for the face. Heard my name called out, um, turned round and seen Birdie's car. Um, couldn't see him, because the car's lower than me, so I took a step forward, up through the window, and had the shotgun. Silver tint off the top of the gun, but I don't know whether that was just the sunshine hitting it or... But directly facing me, just two black holes looking right at me. Yeah, ready and waiting and... Pop! Shot us. Two policewomen came running up to me, asking if I was all right. They all rushed us inside to the police station. They're worried about he's coming back around again. They're shouting to people to get off the streets. There's a gunman loose. Back in the car, Paul Goodwin was still following Bird, but as they moved out of Whitehaven, he was joined by a police car. And at that point, I'm aware of the police cars behind me now, uh, the, the first police car. Um, so they came past me and in front of me. Right. And then he, uh, the guy with the gun turned round to go onto Coach Road. The police vehicle was now directly behind Bird. Paul followed with the officer he'd picked up. The police cars pulled out to go to obviously overtake to go down, down you know, follow the guy down there. But there's a taxi coming uphill. Right. And then the, the, he gets right alongside the taxi and just shoots the, the taxi driver. Where's that? That's where that red car is. Yeah. Right there. So the policeman who'd been in Paul's car now jumped out to help Terry Kennedy, the cab driver who'd just been shot. The police car also stopped, then Bird accelerated up the road and disappeared around the corner. When the police car and Paul got to the junction, they'd lost him. Now you two... The police went that way. Yeah, and so you went up and here? And I went up here. Right. Why did you go up here? Well, they went that way. Uh, that just, just if, if they didn't find him that way, if I turned um, this way, I can then phone in and so see Yeah, You're now part so of the police operation, effectively. There's a well, car going that way and you're going this way. Up this road, Paul met another cabbie who'd just seen Bird. Paul called 999 and told the police they'd gone in the wrong direction. Was this a key moment? Bird had briefly been chased by the police, but had managed to get away and was heading towards the village of St Bees. He would kill again. If you hear that the police were pursuing this man as he left Whitehaven yeah. and then lost him, that might surprise you. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd like to look at the detail of who was pursuing him. Uh, was it, you know, a transit van and an unarmed officer? Who was doing it? Uh, that's the detail we need to look at. It sounds like a missed opportunity, though, doesn't it? Not if it, a missed opportunity. It, what? A, to stop him. A, a, an officer by themselves in a vehicle. Uh, how do they stop him? I don't know, but you would hope that the police were behind him, and then they were, and then he managed to get away. So when he went to St B's, he was running away from the police and he succeeded. Uh, I, I go back to the point, how does one unarmed officer, if that's the case, stop him? Whether or not the police could have done any more, from now on, Bird's behaviour appears to have changed. Up until now, he shot people he knew, three dead and four injured. By 10.45, 
he'd headed south, and his attacks were about to become more random. He moved along the back roads. There was no one tracking him. He went through the village of St. Bees and on to Egremont. It was now 5 to 11. I came around the corner on my, my road bike, and there was this uh, uh, Citroen Picasso in the middle of the road with the driver's door wide open. Cyclist Barry Moss was about to meet Derek Bird. He was out of his car, holding a hunting rifle and shotgun. He had killed again. He just had this very blank, expressionless face. And then he just sort of scurried past me, got in the, the Picasso and, and shot off down the hill. And it was only when I looked back up the hill, I just saw this, this, this body lying on the, the pavement. And the car had obscured it. And uh, there was two bags of shopping and a, and, and a, a handbag lying on the floor. 57-year-old Susan Hughes was the first of three people to be shot in Egremont. Within a minute or so, Les Hunter was the second when Bird called him over for directions. As I walked towards him, I seen the shotgun on the passenger side seat of his car and I seen him start to lift it up. Well, right then I turned my head away and then one shot went, caught me fierce on the side nearly deafened me, and as I bent down, he put the, put the other barrel into me back. And that's what knocked me forward and finished me, you know what I mean? I just went down and I couldn't get back up. Ken Fishburne was next, shot and killed as he walked across Egremont Bridge. Anybody who crossed his path now was a potential victim. It's 11 o'clock. Cumbria police are dealing with an incident in White... a shooting in Whitehaven. The police were called to... Cumbria police are a small force covering a large area. By now, Bird was moving so fast that officers were still reacting to shootings in Whitehaven as Bird made his way through communities further south. The reality of these incidents is they literally... Uh, officers would be, say, at St Bees, uh, and report would come in, he's now at Egremont. They'd be they'd forward deploy, get down to Egremont, and then of course say, well, no, no actually, uh, there's someone, uh, something happened at sea scale. So it shows the complexity of the situation. And there's a mixture of armed officers and unarmed officers deployed throughout there. So 40 minutes after the first 999 call reporting shots having been fired, there are now five people dead and many more injured. And there are 42 armed officers moving around here looking for Bird with orders to shoot on sight. But of course, Bird was a taxi driver. He knew these roads, so he was able to stay one step ahead. And he kept moving. When he left Egremont, he headed inland to the tiny village of Wilton. I believe two people shot at this location over. With so many victims, Cumbria's emergency services called for help from other counties. This air ambulance has come from Yorkshire. Roger, that's November Yankee 037110. Two patients, both shot over. Right, I've got somebody outside of a vehicle down on the right. Uh, right far. Their first call out was to Wilton. One of you want to head down the uh, lane here? When they touched down two hours after the shooting, they were the first medical team on the scene. Their only job was to confirm death. Yeah, Roger, Dave, we've got two casualties, two casualties, both DOA, both injuries incompatible with life, over. Please add on scene. Those casualties were Jennifer and James Jackson, who'd been shot at two minutes past 11. In just seven minutes, Bird had shot five people, four of them fatally. By now, the police had Derek Bird's mobile number and were trying to make contact. Their calls went unanswered. As he fled Wilton, Bird killed again. 65-year-old Spike Dixon murdered as he headed home for lunch. Within minutes of confirming the deaths in Wilton, the team got another call. A farmer has been killed in Gosforth. Reports of someone shot in the head over. So you're going to the Red Admiral Public House at Gosford? Yeah, Roger, Dave. Uh, I'll see if we'll be airborne in about two minutes, over. 
It was 11.20 when Gary Purden was shot as he cut the hedge of his uncle's farm. He's a former professional rugby league player. He used to play for Whitehaven and coached youngsters. He's well known in West Cumbria. Yeah, just liaised uh, with a police officer. This patient is uh, deceased. It was here, just up the coast at Sea Scale, where Derek Bird's murdering was at its most random. He was killing people as he drove along, shooting at people who wouldn't move out of his way on the road. And here, just at the top of the hill, two people murdered within a matter of yards. We've got uh, maybe one patient trapped. One person trapped, yeah. Um, and the car is actually on its side. On the outskirts of the village, the first victim was 23-year-old Jamie Clark. Bird shot at him, and the estate agent's car went off the road. The police are now saying that people as far south as sea scale should stay indoors because armed officers are pursuing... Things are still developing, uh, we're told, that the chap that the police are looking for, Derek Bird... There are unconfirmed Rowley. reports that two people have died in a shooting incident in West Cumbria. The police we need the people in Whitehaven and Millam areas uh, and into the West Lakes to stay indoors and shelter until further notice. Warnings were being issued, but emergency services were being held back. Local people were having to deal with birds' victims. As I came down this road, I suddenly noticed that there was a car stopped there, and there was obviously glass and everything on, and, and someone screaming, and two ladies were tending to the man who'd been shot. The injured man was pub landlord Harry Berger. He was shot in the arm as he reversed to get out of birds' way. Staff from the doctor's surgery cared for Harry in this community centre. It was an hour and a half before he was airlifted to hospital, where he's now recovering. I gather that the ambulance services would not be let in until, this, until there was no danger. And I find it strange that my colleagues, nurses from the surgery, the members of the public were all helping out here, trying to look after the bodies or trying to help the injured man when the ambulance services were standing off. And it was certainly obvious at that time that the gunman wasn't in C-scan. That delay could have been crucial. You know, talk about the first few minutes of any, of after any kind of accident being very important. It was a concern we heard more than once. From the moment the shootings were declared a major incident, ambulance crews were held back by police until each area was considered safe. In some cases, it was hours before they were allowed in. If the scene is still dangerous and you've got someone on the, on the loose with a 2-2 uh, a, a rifle, sound moderator and a sight, um, and you don't know where they are, what you've got to do is secure the scene first and be sure it's safe, and then bring people in. Travel this route, and part of the horror is in the arbitrary way Derek Bird decided who would die. Along the coast road, 64-year-old grandfather Michael Pike was cycling home when he was shot twice from behind. And then just a few hundred yards away, Bird approached Jane Robinson, an animal lover who had been filmed by the BBC along with her twin sister. Jane Robinson had been out handing out catalogues door to door along this road and she was nearly home. She lived just around the corner. She was yards away from her own front door. Derek Bird pulled up and shouted over to her. He did with her what he'd done to other people. He asked her directions. She leaned forward to listen to him and he shot her. A family friend then went to her house to tell her twin sister. He came in and he said, I'm not supposed to tell you, but how can I not when you're, you're his sister? And she, he, said, he said, I've got to tell you that Jane, Jane, and he didn't say had been shot, but I knew what he meant. Oh, she meant a lot to me, yes, very much so. We were very close. We may have the odd argument, but we were terribly close. We were two halves of the same person. Jane Robinson was shot at 11.29. She was the last person to die. 
Derek Bird drove into the Lake District, shooting as he went. We don't know why he chose this road, but the route would have taken him over the mountains and away from Western Cumbria. In the end, the choice was made for him. He'd badly damaged the car. By the time he reached the village of Boot, the right tire had completely come off. The wheel rim was grinding along the tarmac. You can see from the, from the scratch, the wheel's completely gone. He's just... Ralph Jackson owns the farm where Bird finally ended his journey. So is this where he abandoned the car? This is where he abandoned the car. So just, right here? Just there where the other tire where, where it's braked. Oh, you see where he's braked here? And everything's yeah. there, and that's where his other sunk in there. So this is the end of the journey here, then, right here? Yeah. By this time, he's abandoned the car, he's got the gun. He gets here, what happens? He's met two folk on the bridge, and he just said to... What, what they say is he just said to them that, it's all right, I'm not going to hurt you, and went past them. That was at 12.30 and the two walkers were the last people to see Derek Bird alive. A few minutes later, they heard a shot. By the time Derek Bird got here, the shooting had stopped. He was on foot now, and he ended up in this larch wood at the foot of the fell, and it's here that he turned the gun on himself. What do you think about that he, he got this far? He got, he got managed to get to here? I would have thought that he would have, they would have stopped him before he ever got anywhere near here. At four minutes past one, police with sniffer dogs discovered his body. Since shooting his twin brother, Derek Bird had covered 45 miles. It's two hours and 41 minutes since the first call to the police. There are 30 crime scenes across Western Cumbria, and including him, 13 people are now dead. You know the criticism and that is that, in fact, you were overstretched, and that's why you didn't catch him. He was always ahead of you, and then he, he, he ended it, not you. Uh, uh, that's, a, that's, an, that's an obvious comment to make. He's always mobile. Um, at no point did we have the opportunity to bring this to an end any sooner than we did. Um, an incident of this size and nature would be a demand on any police force uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, let alone us in Cumbria. Uh, and you've talked a number of times about, you know, small force. You've got to remember, it's a huge geographical area and a small community. It is only five days since Derek Bird travelled across West Cumbria taking people's lives. The emotions are still raw, there is horror at what he did, but also a surprising amount of compassion for someone who turned against his own. What do you think of him when you think of Derek Bird? I think of him as a nice lad. I honestly do. Some people will say that's extraordinary. It I mean, is. That... It's... I don't know, I don't know whether it's because I like to see the good in everybody, but um, I'm, I'm not... I don't want to condemn him. Obviously, he has an effect. He's got to have an effect. But um, he's already ruined so many lives there. Eh? He's not going to ruin mine. I think you, you read about people who do horrific things and you hate them because they're monsters in time that's how that man will be remembered but I just I just remember looking at the face of a normal guy Richard Bilton reporting there and last night David and Derek Bird's older brother Brian described them both as very caring family people he offered his condolences to the families affected by his brother's actions. He looks down, hopefully, at the entrance to the maze. Peering closer, the young scientist watches the oil confidently navigating the pathway. His mind moves to medicine. Could we navigate a body in the same way? A smile creeps onto his face as the oil emerges. Science on BBC Radio 4. Material World every Thursday at 4.30.
Birthday celebrations don't get any bigger than this. Ahead of Saturday's Trooping the Colour, we join the Grenadier Guards as they prepare for their role in the spectacular military parade. For Queen and Country, now on BBC One and BBC HD.